Perfect. So hello and welcome everyone to the Chester County History Center History Matters Speaker Series, generously sponsored by the Haverford Trust Company. As we have a few folks logging on, I'll just go over some of our upcoming events. So our next History Matters Speaker Series will be the Unlikely General, Mad Anthony Wayne and the Battle for America. Uh, and this will be with Mary uh, Stockwell, the author, and that will be in our new year on January 10th. January 19th, join our curator, Ellen Enslow, for book groups. January's book is The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine by Serhi Plaki. So if you're enjoying our program, sign up today for a CCHD membership and benefit from not only supporting a wonderful local nonprofit, but also from free museum and library admission, exclusive members only events, discount on select programs and more. A few housekeeping items. Um, this talk will be recorded and the recording will be available within 48 hours of tonight's program. So just make sure you keep an eye out on your uh, email for that link. If you have any questions throughout the program, please make sure to put them in the chat box as we will be having a Q&A session at the end. Alrighty, so our speaker tonight is Ellen Enslow. She is the Director of Collections and Curator at the Chester County History Center. She is primarily responsible for the care of the museum collection and making it accessible to the public through exhibitions, programs, group tours, student visits, and by answering research inquiries. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Ellen. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I'm glad to be here and to share a little bit about the museum collection. And I should say, for those of you who might be familiar with the History Center's museum artifacts, the largest sub-collection within the museum are the textiles and the clothing in particular. And this is one fraction of that large collection. I'm going to start the slideshow. I see that someone has raised their hand. And Lindsay, if you're able to help that person, that would be great. And I'm going to start here to um, get the slideshow started. All right, can everyone see that? I am hoping that's the case. In fact, I'm going to get back out of that and I'm going to go to view full, enter full screen, and I'll be back in business here. So um, hopefully um, you all have a good view of the, uh, the title slide of this program. It's called Profiles, Chester County Clothing of the 1800s. For those of you who visit our exhibits and have been around the History Center for a while or been in and out, this may look like a familiar uh, title. And that is because this program is based on an exhibit that we installed in 2013 that featured the 19th century in Chester County and the clothing that people wore. And I would like to give full credit to the people who helped with that, which includes a very stalwart team of volunteers who dressed mannequins, who helped with installations in a variety of ways, and also the former museum collections manager, Heather Hansen, who coordinated that team and helped with the label copy. So it was quite a, a team effort to say the least, it usually is, but in this case, it took a long time. There are many people who really like to look at installations of historical clothing. And when you see some of the uh, results of their work, I'll talk a little bit about it throughout the installation or excuse me, the program, and also bring it up again at the end of the program so that you can see a little bit about the work that went into that installation. Why the 19th century? Well, it was a very pivotal year, or excuse me, a pivotal century for um, fashion industry in many different ways. And also because it's a strength that we have and there was plenty of material to, to uh, select from. The, excuse me, Ellen. Yep. Super quick, sorry, we are not able to see um, your screen. Oh, share screen, there we go. Um, hang on a second. 
share screen. Do I see a share screen here? Uh, let me see. Um, would you make me a co-presenter? Or am I already doing that? Video settings. Sorry, folks. We will get back in gear momentarily. There we go. My fault. It's been so long Perfect. since I've done a Zoom program. Oh, my word. Um, believe it or not, I actually do more live programs now than Zoom ones. So thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, I didn't get to the next slide. So here we are. <laughs> you're, you're, I'm not having to backtrack. Um, here you see that um, we have a public document, which is part of the basis for some of the research that we do with the programs and the exhibits that we create. The Chester County Archives and Record Services Department, which is in the Government Service Center on Westtown Road, is one of the primary sources for public records. Of course, we have a fabulous manuscript collection in the Chester County History Center Library. And so we can get some anecdotal information through letters and diaries about people and their daily life, which in some cases refers to clothing. But we can look at public records such as this probated inventory from 1845, and in this instance, I picked this one out just because it was related, it was pertaining to a man. Now, needless to say, men were the ones who had wills, particularly before 1848, and you'll hear more about that in a minute, um, but they had the wills and the probated inventories related to their estates. By the 1840s, though, the references to clothing, and particularly men's clothing, was much more limited than it had been in the 1700s. There was a value associated with clothing, and I'll uh, go into that in, in a little bit more detail. Um, let's see if I can forward this. And I'll start with the early 1800s. The exhibit fell into the entire century from 1800 to 1899, and we divided it chronologically in, into not exact quarters, but to, into sections that related to changes in fashion. And we started with the Greek and Roman design that you might be familiar with, particularly uh, if not only you, you like um, clothing history, you may also be a fond of Jane Austen movies uh, that were made by uh, various British and American uh, pr production companies in the 1990s, as an example, and since then. And that is a look that was very much popular in, in the 18, early 1800s. And part of the, the Greek and Roman or the Greek and Roman interest in the columnar style, as it's often referred to, or the empire style, dates back to the mid 1700s when Pompeii was first discovered archaeologically, and that led to a great interest in interior design, fashion, and the like that reflected something of the Greek and Roman um, history of of um, not only looks but also thinking. Uh, Chester County Book Group several months ago read a book called First Principles, and it, I'd recommend it despite this sort of mundane sounding title. Um, it's actually quite interesting, and it's about how Greek and Roman um, thought and um, law and so forth shaped the thinking and the education of the first four presidents of the United States. And that, of course, is this era. One of the things we did in the exhibit as well is to include a quilt and it, it, each uh, one quilt per section so that it would reflect something of the style of that era. Here you see the uh, quilt that's hanging on the purple wall and that is a roller printed um, pillar print in blue. And that was a very popular print. And I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see here although it's not the focus of this conversation per se. But it certainly reflected the interior design and the textile printing that was very popular. It was printed in blue or green or red or combinations thereof, and it was used in upholstery and other kinds of fabrics. Um, we don't see it, of course, in our clothing. It's a different kind of fabric. Um, other people may have seen that in clothing, but here you see examples of what we had in Chester County. And one of the things I do want to say while I'm talking about these different um, eras and so forth is that while this is not a talk specifically about what Quaker clothing is, 
I do think that it's important to sort of bring that up periodically because it did sort of have a, a visual impact on the community um, throughout the century. Here are two of the dresses that you saw in that overall section. And these have that long, narrow look. They have the uh, high waist and they are very slim looking. And of course, very uh, popular at that time. One of the things that we talked about in each section of the exhibit that I think is worth repeating is talking about production, the layers or the garments and how the outerwear and the underwear went together and the significance of the fashions or the, the following of fashion or the lack of following the fashion and what the influences were. And we also talked about the, the people who were wearing these things. I should say that many of the um, Chester County addicts, if you will, over the many decades that the institution has been around, have been very rich with many kinds of uh, material culture, as we call it today, and at the time people were calling it simply clothing. But we can see that we don't always know who, we might know the donor and have a very good record of that, but we may not necessarily know who in the family or acquaintance or in the neighborhood may have worn these pieces. But these are two examples that do show the, um, not only the fashion of the outline or the profile, as the exhibit was named, but also the type of fabric that's being used. These are not your everyday dresses. These are silk. And the one on the left in particular was probably more of a purple color. And today it comes across a little bit more like tan. You can see some of the original color in some of the seams, but it has faded over time. Not at all unusual because the dyes pre-Civil War, this is early 1800s, were somewhat fugitive and were not necessarily um, uh, as bright even when they were new. On the right hand side, you see that combination of the uh, variations on the browns and blues. And we have a number of dresses that have that combination. I think that was considered fairly popular at that time. Other dresses that were part of this mix include these more plain styles. Again, they are fashionable, but they're simple. You notice that they don't have the ruffles or the pleats or the particular um, sort of sawtooth um, diamond shape uh, embellishments around the neck and so forth. Instead, they are very simple. And these are very likely to be Quaker clothing examples. Not all of the things, like I said, do we know the provenance for. This does though fit in with the Quakers book of discipline, which was sort of the guidebook for life in the way the Quakers influenced or um, how they were influenced by their faith to live out their life. These are beautiful dresses. The two on the left are silk and in excellent condition. And they would not have been inexpensive when they were new. And as a result, it gives a good example of the idea that Quakers were not averse to using high quality materials, but they, uh, the, the idea was that it would be done in an understated and um, sustainable manner. So therefore this clothing would have been in theory worn repeatedly in order to get good youth out of it or to certainly take advantage of um, good quality workmanship in order to create it. You see that on the, the dress on the right, excuse me, the left-hand side, there is a waistband that fits over a skirt that, and those two things are separate. And I'm going to show you a better example of how that, um, how that worked in a different slide. On the right-hand side, you see a cotton dress that is also very simple, but again, it's fashionable. It's in the fashion of the day. It just doesn't have all of the embellishments. One of the things that the high waistband allowed, you can see on the left-hand side, was a shorter jacket for women. And there you can see also the influence of men's tailoring. In a minute, you'll see a slide of a men's jacket. But this was, on the left-hand side, something that would have been worn, of course, outdoors, and um, would have been fit over one of those very long, narrow dresses that you saw in the earlier slides. And just for fun, on the right-hand side, we have a 
a slide here of just one pair of many sh silk sh um, slippers in our collection. And in fact, this is not one of those that actually has a label inside it, um, but we do have some that are have those early um, shoemaker labels, which is quite a, a nice thing to be able to show historically. Again, we have silk on the right-hand side, and I believe it's a cotton fabric on the left-hand side. And here you can see on the left, the man's jacket that, of course, it's a little bit longer than the woman's jacket, but you can see how high the waist is on it, and then the tails are uh, extend down behind. On the right-hand side, we have a little boy's skeleton suit. It's not always clear where the name skeleton suit has come from, but it is believed that it would have to do with the form-fitting nature of the suit. Here you see the example of this little boy's military look. Um, he is out of diapers, therefore he has um, actually long slacks or trousers to go with his suit rather than breeches. And it's highly decorative and it's something that probably wasn't worn very often as we know children do grow out of their clothing fairly quickly. But this is a, a wonderful example. And uh, if you remember seeing it in the earlier slide, um, it's rather small. And so obviously a lot of love and care went into that. And you, there you can see on the left-hand side, that little skeleton suit on a, on a little dress, uh, on a, on a uh, form in which we could show it three-dimensionally. Here in front and center, however, we'd sort of get into the underlying uh, forms, if you will, of women's undergarments to help create the shape of the body that would fit the dress. And one of the things that we in the museum world usually have to counteract is that people were, all people were smaller back then, whenever back then is. Certainly um, uh, health, nutrition, and other factors played into the, um, uh, the welfare of human beings and yes, some people were shorter or on the shorter side um, than maybe perhaps today. But we have plenty of examples of clothing that show a wide variety of shapes, including a pair of men's slacks that suggest he was well over six feet tall. And this would be from the 19th century. We have women who are thin, we have women who are robust. And here is an example of one who um, is on the taller side to say the least, and what you see here in the front might have been used to hold a busk. And what do I mean by that? These are stays or and um, part of the undergarments of the early 1800s in which the center example would be one that is soft. It has, this is cording and as are these sort of chevron arranged stripes here. These are three-dimensional and they add support to this undergarment. On the left side though and on the right harder to see in the center is an open pocket. In that open pocket there would have been something known as a busk and you can see examples of them over here on the right hand side. The busk would have been in this would have been right down the front and center like right across the breastbone of whoever was wearing the undergarment. The idea was to create a more upright posture, and I can't imagine what that must have felt like. They were typically made of wood, um, also baleen from whales or ivory, and these are wooden examples that we have here in the collection, and you can see how they're curved. They didn't necessarily start like that way. That was based on um, uh, how the person wearing the garment's body shaped over years or months shape the busk as she continued to wear it over time. There were some dresses that didn't have nearly so much foundation um, underneath them, although it, um, a woman at that time um, had foundation of some kind. But one of the things that you'll notice in these examples of work dresses, now I, I'm gonna draw your attention for just a moment to the two dresses I looked at, we looked at earlier, you see these two striped dresses that are silk. This is the front, obviously, of each dress. And you say, well, how did she get into the dress? Well, they, the closure is in the back. So she needed someone to help her get dressed. However, up here, we have what are known as short gowns. This is the bodice or top part of a work dress. And look at the front. It is very simple. 
and it is drawstring and she can dress herself with no need for any help. She would have worn foundation garments under that, but this is something that she would have been able to manage on her own typically. And little girls were wearing the same thing as the women of that day. And just for fun, we also installed in the exhibit this beautiful christening or baby's gown that is not your typical white christening gown like we are very familiar with, but in fact is a beautiful dark cotton print. And by the way, most of these um, short gowns are made of cotton. Men's clothing uh, that we I referred to a few slides ago and looking at that beautiful blue jacket from the um, uh, early 1800s, it did not change nearly as quickly and rapidly as women's clothing. I think that most people who are aware of fashion history are, are tuned into that. Women's fashion changed much more rapidly. And as a result of that, our museum collection is very typical. Um, we, I would say we have approximately two thirds women's clothing to one third men's clothing. And it could even be a bigger differentiation than that. But on the left-hand side is one example where the men could really, um, if they wanted to, show some individuality with their waistcoats or vests. And you can see a variety of examples that are different kinds of prints or they are also plain. On the right-hand side though, it, I was talking a minute ago about undergarments and women's um, foundation wear was um, a visible in terms of the, um, the stays and the busks. And I should say that petticoats and pantaloons and pantalettes were very much a part of it as well, although we did not include it nearly as many of those in the exhibit. Men's undergarments, though, were a little bit more simple. And you see this shirt here. This is a linen shirt that would have been considered both outerwear and underwear. It looks long, like as, as though it's a nightshirt, when in fact it was day wear and it's made of linen and it um, is long enough to fit underneath his trousers and to serve as his underwear. So it served a dual purpose. And so it um, much more efficient and again, very simple lines compared to some of the undergarments we saw for women. In the second section of the exhibit, we talked about the change in shape and profile from that long narrow look to the uh, uh, more rounded, um, sleeves and so forth and skirts. And we, we talked a little bit more again about the comparison of fashionable clothing and Quaker clothing because the Quakers who lived here, and I didn't mention this at the outset, Quakers were among the founders of Pennsylvania as some of us know. And the uh, William Penn of course was a Quaker and people came here from England, particularly um, the, uh, there were many different group, immigrant groups who came here in the 1600s, but by the time the colony became Pennsylvania, the Quakers were coming from England and Ireland and seeking not only religious uh, freedom, but also economic opportunity. And there were many other groups of people who came as well. And that's why you see the mix of fashion. Here though, one of the things that influenced fashion in the mid 1800s, starting in about 1830 were fashion magazines or women's magazines. This one is Godey's Ladies Book. It was one of the most popular and it was printed in Philadelphia. And if I understand correctly, about 10 years into its production, a woman was given the opportunity to do some of the editing or um, some of the work on the publication. And to make a very long story short, the, the readership that had started out at about 70,000 people increased to well over 100,000 during its heyday. What it was particularly known for were these plate, these printed plates of fashionable dress. Some of them were hand colored as you can see by the example on the right hand side. Fashion was not the only thing that they put in these magazines. There were also um, ways to, uh, there were instructions on how to do different kinds of crafts. There was poetry, there were opinions of the day. And in fact, these magazines for women sent the same mixed messages in the 19th century as women's magazines were sending to women in the 20th century. And that is these beautiful fashions with very tight waists were published in the same issues where there were articles about women's health and how fashion needed to change and become less um, uh, confining. 
But at any rate, these were very popular and influential in their own way. Now here you see the next section of the exhibit, and I'll draw your attention quickly to the portraits in the back. They are a, a wonderful way to actually get a sense of the look of an era. And you can see that men had uh, very, um, we, we can see the vests right here, it's a, but over in this portrait, of course, you don't see his vest, but you do, do see his stock that was around his neck. And it was kind of like, um, I, I had not really heard of stocks until I was looking at them a number of years ago in relation to some clothing research. And it they were like having your neck in a corset for lack of a better description. It was a very uncomfortable, I would assume, way of um, you know, holding your, it, it would certainly have held a, a man's head straight up because of the stiffness of it. But again, a fairly simple um, outfit. The women's dresses here though, you can see have a wide variety of uh, sleeve styles. You can see different kinds of embellishments and slightly different colors. Again, we do not have bright colors here. Some of them are rather subdued. One of the other things that is occurring at about this time would be this advent of the mass produced readily available sewing machine. That uh, was first in the United States available, I believe in the uh, 1829 or so, and they became much more prevalent by the 1840s. The thing that always surprises me, even though I work in the history business, so to speak, is that when I'm looking at clothing of this era and earlier, a lot of it was made with a needle and thread. And when that sinks in, it makes us understand why the value of clothing is so very important. When I was talking about the fashions of the, uh, or how we understand clothing by way of public documents, by the 1800s, when we have probated inventories for people's estates, by this, by this era here that we are looking at from the 18 uh, pre-Civil War, clothing is much less differentiated or distinguished or even bequeathed to other family members. In the 1700s, there is a great deal of specific reference to a piece of clothing or uh, textiles that were used in the home, bedding and the like, and how they are bequeathed to someone. They are passed down because of the value of them is so great. Um, took a lot more time and effort to create. The materials were expensive and the time um, to make them was expensive. And on the left-hand side is that little sewing machine that you saw in the first, in the, the previous slide. And on the right-hand side, that sewing machine is of course later, it's in another part of the, the exhibit, but I just put them together here so that you can um, see the reference to that. Um, once the sewing machine became available, there's actually a little bit of a story behind this. Um, in 1848, in this era, in Pennsylvania, the state legislature passed the Married Women's Property Act. For the first time, women could own real and personal property. They could collect rent on property that they owned. They were no longer responsible for their husband's debts. And essentially they were gaining legal rights. In 1872, after the Civil War, women, uh, a law was passed that allowed women to buy a sewing machine in her, their own right without getting their husband's permission to do so. Pause and consider that. And what kinds of fabric could people in Chester County use to make dresses or other clothing? This is a public record that gives us some insight into that as well. Now you have to remember that we are fairly close to Philadelphia. I don't know if the participants in the program this evening are local or from uh, distant places, but if you are not from Chester County, you may not be aware how simple it is to get to Philadelphia despite a traffic jam on the Schuylkill Expressway as an example. Um, it, but the, the dirt roads and so forth, of course, were problematic in the 1800s. However, we were, people who lived here were in proximity to the largest, at least in the, up until the advent of railroads, it was, uh, Philadelphia was the largest import city on the East Coast. So if you had financial um, 
uh, ability, if you had the time and, and, and energy to um, uh, look at what was fashionable and follow those trends, you probably had access to just about anything that was available on the international market. How do we know this? Um, an assigned estate is something that is created during a bankruptcy proceeding. In this case, a man named Wurstler in Schuylkill Township in Northern Chester County um, did go bankrupt with his retail operation and there were two other men who bought it. And in order for the transaction to be complete, the assigned estate had to include a very detailed inventory. Suffice it to say that this is one of, as you can see from the note, one of 33 pages of the inventory of the man's business. And the, all of the pages are single spaced like you see there. Of those 33 pages, at least 18, if not 20 of them are list after list of specific kinds of fabric. It was an extraordinary collection of different kinds of linen, cotton, silk, whatever. Um, I can't even begin to remember all of the different kinds of fabrics that were available in this inventory. And that shows in some of the clothing that you see here in Chester County. Where people, by the way, were getting the money had to do with agriculture and milling. Those were the two primary income um, producing ventures here in the Chester County area. And there was a lot of export, not only of the raw materials such as flaxseed, but also of um, uh, wheat that would be ground and the mills. It, um, from the, the, um, the grains of wheat into flour, adding value to the finished and creating, if not exactly a finished product, it was an ingredient that had um, taken, it, it, um, going from the grain to the flour was something that was, uh, that made it much more appealing to the consumer because it was one last step that they had to do. So Chester County was doing well because of all of its technology and its climate and its natural resources. And so you can see that this beautiful silk dress here, um, it, this was a wedding dress of a Quaker woman and it is in, again, an impeccable condition. Again, I'll repeat, the quality of the fabric um, was important um, and so was the uh, sort of reuse of that dress in, in, in all likelihood. Um, very um, puffy sleeves that you see in the 1830s, um, 40s in that era. Um, a very simple though reference to what was fashionable in the day. There aren't a lot of embellishments, but my goodness, it's beautiful. And the fabric is as luxurious in person as it appears in this photograph. Here you see examples of two different dresses that are somewhat in, in, in the general um, era of each other. But on the left-hand side, it's a changeable silk, which means that the warp and the weft are two different colors of silk. Um, and depending on how you look at it, it will seem more blue or more cream. That's just one color combination. We have several examples of changeable silks in the collection and including purples and pinks and so forth. So it was quite a fashionable type of silk fabric. And naturally silk was not locally um, harvested or grown. So that is imported fabric, um, but it is made in the style of, people often wonder what a Quaker dress looks like. And this is about as close as it can come on the left-hand side of that Quaker look. It didn't last long and it was only probably worn by plain Quakers in the mid 1800s. But more often than not, Quakers were wearing a simplified version of fashionable dress. On the right-hand side, however, we see a cotton dress. And this was probably something that was more everyday and very simple and becoming more affordable. And it was becoming more affordable because cotton was being um, printed through roller printing um, steps. And um, the, the whole process of dyeing and printing the fabric simplified that part of the production. But in order to feed the machines that were um, spinning the cotton, weaving it into fabric and then printing it in the, as one of its final steps, it required a lot of raw materials. And so the, the human toll is also part of this story. 
The vast majority of cotton fabric that was used either in clothing or quilts or household furnishings and the like, what typically came from the enslaved labor in the southern part of the United States. And there was a lot of raw cotton that was sent to other parts of, to textile mills in the United States and in Europe and, and Great Britain. Here you see examples of boys clothing, and this is important to note, not necessarily because we uh, have a lot of detail. We do know something about some of the um, children or the people who were children when they wore these things or, or what is believed by the family, but the fact that these are little trousers. So I'm gonna move forward and talk a little bit more about adult clothing before I get to children's dresses. This is that same pre-Civil War era where you see the broader skirt, you see um, the embellishment of the decoration, and you see a variety of color. These two dresses, again, the one on the right-hand side would have been a fairly ordinary dress that might have been used in everyday wear. It's not necessarily what I would call a work dress, but it is slightly more casual because you see the buttons in the front. She would have been able to primarily dress herself if her undergarments would be fixed from the front as well. On the left-hand side is a dress that is probably one in which someone, it was probably a maternity dress. And you may see, have remembered me referring to the silk dress at the beginning of the program, um, the sort of um, a tan or uh, olive tannish silk dress in which there, I mentioned something about the waist. Well, here you see it in action where the waist is open wide enough as though it was accommodating a pregnant figure. And so we have several dresses in the collection where there is a drawstring type waistband on the dress, a very practical solution to a condition of life that many women were dealing with in the 19th century on a fairly regular basis. So this would have been wearable over um, numerous years in that regard. And here you see on the close up, a blue silk dress that has a capelet over the shoulders. And let me continue. I'll get back to that in a second. On the left hand side, again, a luxurious silk dress, very simple, but again, you see the changes already in the, the shapes of the sleeves and the, the pleats in the front. The one on the left is a little bit more plain. And of course it does, we do know comes from a Quaker family. And it was the mother of um, either the bride or the groom. She wore that to several of her children's weddings. And so she got good use out of that. And it's again, in very good condition. On the right-hand side is something that's similar in fashion, although the sleeves are showing that um, we can see the transition in the two different kinds of sleeves of those dresses. But what's also interesting is the waistbands are different in the two dresses. And this green printed fabric is very subtle. But one of the fun things we discovered when we were installing the exhibit, because we took the time to really examine things carefully, it, we saw these little buttons and I showed this detail here. And those little buttons are fabric, it's the same fabric as the dress itself. And they are a very clever way to allow the wearer to find the slit for the pocket. In a skirt that uh, with that much fabric, I think it would have been hard to find a pocket. So they put little buttons at the top and the bottom of the pocket slit. A very convenient thing to do. More fancy dresses that you see here and the one on the right in particular is a pattern that's sort of subtle on the one on the left. And there's a beautiful silk fringe on the cuffs and buttons down the front as, and then of course fringe around the bodice. Um, but on the right hand side, you would have seen this one if had it uh, when it was new would have likely been a fairly expensive dress. It was also silk, but it's also plaid. And in order for it to look right, the plaid has to match and to account for all of the darts and the shaping of those pieces, one would have needed to purchase enough fabric to make everything go together. So uh, it was not a small task to um, to create a dress of that nature. And additionally, you can see here on the cuffs and the bottom of the bodice, there is a tri-colored silk fringe that's just gorgeous, very fine silk. 
women and girls had similar dresses, although childhood was becoming a life phase of its own. And here you see two beautiful um, dresses of a similar era. And um, you can just look at the matching sleeves in terms of the shape and where the shoulder is located and how they look together. It would be great if it's, we're very grateful to have an extremely large photo archives where we have many portraits in black and white. And it would be wonderful to see exactly what these things look like. Uh, there's black and white pieces of clothing in color. And I would imagine that these are some of the colors of the fabrics that um, we're looking at in some of those images. This dress, when I was relatively new, I thought was a little bit fancy for being a Quaker dress, but I, I, someone more knowledgeable than I at the time said, oh, hold that thought, because in another muse large museum collection, there are a number of Quaker dresses that have embellishment. And so this could be Quaker, although we cannot say that for sure. Why it could be is that this, this scalloped edge or design is on the side of this sleeve and you might be able to see a little bit of the buttons right here and both sleeves have this scalloped edge and it's the edging is finished in the same fabric as the dress and the buttons are covered in that fabric as well so it's understated but it's it's a very beautiful piece um, again we have this is pre-civil war and but we have a straight sleeve that is not puffed either at the top or the bottom and as we move forward through time, we begin to see, if you remember that other dress that had the green and red plaid, here we have a smaller check or plaid um, pattern in darker color, dark colors as well. But we see a difference in the sleeves and again, the, the fringe embellishment. A lot of people had these remove, it was fashionable to have these removable collars and we have quite a collection of those as well. And of course, cuffs, lace cuffs would have been um, a, a really nice touch at the time. And this is not likely to have been worn by a Quaker. More examples of the same style or similar style. You can see that there is a narrow sleeve underneath, um, but this big bell sleeve was very popular um, right before the Civil War. And again, these are good dresses that were probably not worn very often. And they're fairly lightweight, I, I might add. Um, they're not that heavy satiny silk like in some of the earlier examples. Uh, repetition on the left-hand side of that other plaid dress. But here on the right is the blue dress that you saw in the group shot several slides ago. What's interesting about this piece that we don't really have illustrated in this photograph is that it actually has two tops two bodices. The capelet that fits over it right now could have been worn with either top or with either bodice. The example that you were looking at shows, of course, the long sleeves, but it also had a, um, a very sort of what we might call a capped sleeve bodice that would have been probably more likely for evening wear. So the skirt remained, but the top changed. And so therefore it became an efficient piece of clothing to wear. It's a beautiful piece in real life. Um, I believe it was um, a wedding dress of a family uh, uh, of a bride who was married in the southern part of the county. Undergarments here, I mentioned the pantalettes and the pantaloons. Here you see some of that. There were chemises that fit underneath. And I would have to say that we didn't talk too much in this particular exhibit about petticoats, although to keep those skirts round, there would have been multiple petticoats, which would caused health issues. Um, there were, one historian calculated that women wore up to 30 pounds of petticoats, and that could have been multiple cotton, um, uh, thin petticoats, as well as quilted petticoats and the like. And women in the past, as well as today, are not above embellishing things. And here you see this bodice is the only part of this dress that we have with these big puffy sleeves. And this is called over here in the lower left-hand side, a sleeve puff that is filled with down, down feathers. And it would have been, you can squeeze it down to nothing because of the down um, feathers inside. And that's what they would do. And they would stuff it into the round part of the sleeve and that would keep it looking round 
for a lengthy period of time because otherwise the sleeve would collapse in appearance and it would not be very attractive. You can see some of the children's clothing also of this era, but also here's a bodice where you can see an embellishment for the bosoms. And so uh, nothing was uh, beyond um, improvising, shall we say. Children's clothing, again, is an, a great example of how fabric was used. In this section of the exhibit, we had a quilt that had turkey red fabric in it. And you can see it behind this other child's dress. We don't know actually how much turkey red print or cotton fabric was used in clothing at all. We see it a, a lot in Chester County quilts. But these two little dresses obviously are clear documentary examples of the use of turkey red fabric in at least children's clothing. They are slightly different eras, but the one on the right is certainly a dress that was used fairly often and certainly um, has that well-worn look, but it's still in pretty nice shape and they're absolutely precious little dresses, as is this brown one on the right-hand side. And even girls were wearing hoop skirts starting in the 1850s. I mentioned the, the uh, vast number of uh, petticoats to keep a circle or a skirt round um, that were required, but um, the hoop skirt began to replace that in the 1850s. And initially they were round for the round skirts, but they later became elliptical and you'll see why in a second. Um, and just because I can't resist, we have little children depicted in illustrations and of course, plenty of little children's shoes. Fashion plates really influenced the clothing after the Civil War. And here's just one example. This is the beginning of the third section of the exhibit. And you can see this is high fashion, very formal. And this is the dress from both sides. In this era, in the 18, um, you know, post-Civil War, people were interested in being seen looking good, both coming and going. And I joke that the um, undergarments that would hold up this clothing meant that women were upholstered. Uh, the underpinnings were the same thing or very similar to what was used in upholstered um, uh, seating furniture in parlors in the, as an example, in the late 1800s. This particular piece has, of course, this jacket, bodice, whatever, that goes over the top. And then this skirt has this enormous pleating and this asymmetrical arrangement with this swag in the front and, of course, the train in the back. This is not necessarily the um, piece that was worn underneath that specific dress, but she could have worn something like it. It's made of buckram and it's very stiff. And even though it's from the 1800s, it is still um, it still stands out and is is a very um, solid undergarment and would have supported silk fabric over top of it or whatever would have been worn. This is another dress that we have in the collection, although we don't know as much about the, um, this piece as we do some of the others. Again, uh, she was seen fabulously coming or going. For those people who care about women's health and fashion and consider um, dimensions, her waist is 24 inches on the outside of the dress. So if you count the, the thickness of the fabric and everything underneath, she, had a, she was very much cinched in. And in fact, when the people dressed this mannequin, they really had to put a lot of material right up above the waist because a lot of her um, you know, her flesh and everything else was really pushed out of the way in order to make that waist so small. And if this doesn't look like drapery um, that you would see in a Victorian parlor, I don't know what does. And this particular train on the back was detachable. It, it was buttoned into place and could be removed so as not to get dirty. Another example of the era, this is for the later, later 1800s. And this was we had a, a virtual exhibit on our website for a long time. And there was a student who was in a fashion design class in France who requested permission to replicate this dress. And we said, go for it. And she did a fantastic representation. We gave her numerous photographs 
and she was kind enough to model the dress and have a photograph taken of herself and she sent it back to us, which was absolutely wonderful. This was a wedding dress of the post-Civil War era. And uh, again, it's in a beautiful condition and it's part of that 1870s, 80s look of, um, again, we, we're, we're not, we don't have quite the round skirts that we had during the Civil War, but we have much more embellishment and, and a much greater amount of um, shaping going on here than we did in the 1800, early 1800s. This overview of the clothing of this post-Civil War era includes a wide variety of examples. On the right-hand side is a Quaker dress, and it's not easy to see in this particular slide, but it has a lot of little white dots, polka dots all over it. And on the left-hand side is a dress, believe it or not, made of handkerchiefs, or so we're, we are led to believe. Beautiful satin examples that really show uh, an elegant simplicity. Here, of course, there is embellishment in different key points of the dresses, but the elegance here comes in the simplicity of the design. There is a little bit of a train on the one on the right-hand side, but it's not nearly as elaborate as the previous dresses that you saw from the high fashion pictures a couple of slides ago. These two women were substantial in size and they were, um, I, I will get to another slide where you can see that they were actually fairly tall individuals. This dress is one that I would love to have seen when it was new because I would love to have known what the, the lace color really was. It was probably never bright white, but I think it might've been lighter than what we see here because that does change over time. But truly every decorative technique that could be thought of, I think was included. We have a, an asymmetrical skirt, uh, overskirt with plaid underneath, and we've got ruffles and we have bows in the back and rosettes. Quite a tour de force. This is a dress that um, is a fairly small in size. And thanks to the eagle eyes of a former coworker who helped with this exhibit, who watched the series, The Gilded Age, she saw the episode number five and immediately sent an email because if it looks for sure like um, the production company um, uh, copied the dress. Now, there could be a reason why there's a second dress like this, but since dresses were still not necessarily mass produced, we, we at least like to think that this dress that is in the CCHC collection was copied um, in terms of the costuming for that particular episode. It's a wonderful piece and it's a, um, it's a, it's a sort of a textured silk. Again, a silk dress, um, silk is still popular and this is something that would have been for, uh, you know, not, not every day at all. Uh, but again, you see that sort of, um, a cylindrical look with some pleats and um, ruffles and uh, that fabulous. Uh, I'm not sure that that's changeable silk, but it does look slightly different depending on how the light hits it. Also post-Civil War, we had these beautiful dresses that have this fabulous um, array of colors. And we see these two amazing gowns that have very large skirts and would have been worn on different occasions with um, the one on the left also has two bodices, one with sleeves and one without. And on the right hand side, we have this dress with these bell, similar bell sleeves um, that are, show just a wonderful arrangement of the fabric. Very formal and uh, not worn very often, um, but high quality and certainly um, are, uh, representative of the upper echelon of the um, economic society. On the right hand side, we don't know too much about the dress, but we thought it was a wonderful example of um, the um, post civil or post civil war era where you could see, and the later 1800s where you can see um, uh, the, the changing profile of women's fashions. It's, it's similar to those very expensive dresses at the beginning of the section, but is much more simplified and um, therefore in, in theory more affordable and even better yet, the waist is not nearly as tightly cinched in. 
On the left-hand side is a wedding dress worn by um, Eleanor Bechtel Moore, who, to make a long story short, was from the Chester Springs area. And when her husband died of cholera, they had moved to uh, Missouri and, and several family members died there of cholera, including her husband. She came back to Chester County and ended up becoming a teacher and then principal at the Soldiers Orphan School in um, historic Yellow, what is now Historic Yellow Springs. It's a beautiful dress and um, that dates actually from the 18th. That's pre-Civil War, but um, still it's, it's a little bit out of order here, but I love that dress. Children's dresses, of course, we think of girls, but of course there were boys' dresses that typically they were worn while the boy was still in diapers. This is an example of a variety of ages and they were pro they may have been out of diapers. It's hard to tell. We don't necessarily know the provenance, but the reason we can assume that they are boys' dresses or that boys were among those who wore them is that sort of military look that was popular during the Civil War as well as the bright colors and the very dark patterning of the one on the right hand side. The one on the right is a beautiful wool piece. It's just very fine. And again, we see a combination of dresses that might, have, these are probably worn by girls um, and they would have been worn over the one, the, the little red one on the left hand side would have been worn over pantalettes or um, pantaloons, I should say. And you can see the variety of of designs that are simplified versions of the adult clothing in the 19th century. So we no longer have stays, but instead we have corsets and the women are really strapped into their dresses. And you can see that there is quite a bit of boning in some of these and the shape of the, the profile changed throughout the 1800s and, and the corsets underneath were what helped to do that. Uh, we also have some of the, I'm joking, the, the, the sort of upholstery material here uh, that is used for bustles to um, and expand um, the back of the dress or sometimes the sides, but usually it's in the back. And finally, we get to ready-made versus handmade. We don't have a lot of ready-made clothing here in this example. And one of the things I did not mention in um, section three on the far side there was a crazy quilt that helped to exemplify the silk and the asymmetry of the dresses that you saw particularly the fashionable ones over here though you see a tumbling block pattern quilt force uh, made of silk and this is one in which um, you can tell that the colors are much brighter than before and these dresses in this light are a little bit subdued so these pictures are a little bit better Mauve was one of the first chemical dyes, if not the first. I have to double check on that to make sure I'm giving you accurate information. But it was used from a sort of a chemical, uh, like a tar-like quality uh, uh, material. And it contributed to the colors of mourning, if you're familiar with the mourning customs of clothing in the late 1800s. And this purple and gray and black dress is one in which, of course, post-Civil War, is this new purple color where you see a better example of the purple than we did with that early 1800s purple striped dress. Here, this dye is, is, is much more fast, color fast. And that's because most of it is coming from chemicals rather than nature. Same thing with this chartreuse. This is part of the chemical dye um, surge in the late 1800s. It's a wonderful example, small train, um, a very beautiful dress. And underneath it, here you see, instead of a, a round or circular hoop, you see an elliptical one. So these were the shapes that they were aiming for in the later 1800s. Day dresses and men's smoking jackets took full advantage of the chemical dyes that were available. This men's um, house jacket or smoking jacket is absolutely gorgeous. It's very simple and it closes in the front very, very, um, uh, it, it would have been very fashionable at that time. Same thing with these women's dresses. These are house dresses. You can't see it easily, but they close in the front. Again, she could have dressed herself and she would have been 
could have uh, received visitors, I think, even in, in dresses like this. Uh, she would not have gone out of the house in a dress like this, but within the confines of her own home, this would have been perfectly acceptable. They are beautiful wool, fine wool dresses. And again, we see the men's clothing. Um, men's clothing did not change a great deal or not nearly as quickly as women's did. Another fine example, it's a variation. It's a sort of a uh, an attempt at um, copying high fashion. It doesn't have nearly the uh, skill that's involved with all of the darts and the pleats and everything else that you saw in some of the earlier examples. But nevertheless, it's a very nice piece that would have fit into the mold of post-Civil War clothing. We believe these are boys' dresses. They are colorful plaid wool pieces. And we put them near the Paisley adult clothing because of the popularity of the color combinations. Bright colors were very popular in the 1870s, 80s, 90s. Um, in part, you can see that in the crazy quilts of the time. And this was influenced by the silks that had become available from Asia and um, the chemical dyes that helped create the rainbow of colors. Children's clothing, and I'm backtracking a little bit in terms of, of era, um, but children's clothing here, again, wool examples, and it's probably, we do know that it's a boy's dress on the left, and he unfortunately died at the age of three, and this dress was hung onto as a memorial. The dress on the right was worn by a little girl in the late 1800s, and it was donated to the Historical Society many decades ago by the woman who wore it, and she was an older woman at that time. So I would like to thank the installation team from this exhibit who helped to make this program essentially possible. And you can see some of them at work and I apologize that I don't have absolutely everyone in a photograph, but you can see the effort that went into um, installing this. And when people say they love um, fashion exhibits, we appreciate the enthusiasm but we also wanna make sure you know it takes about eight hours minimum to dress each mannequin. So it's a laborious process and um, thank you to all of the people who helped with that project. And now I think I've practically gone over time but we have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. And I see there's a chat box going on here. Um, I'm going to, uh, here we go, let's see. We didn't, uh, we don't have a book on this. Someday we might get there. That would be great. I would love to do that. Women made their own clothing. Also dressmakers made clothing. And so it was not unusual to have a combination of both um, homemade as well as professionally made clothing. But it was typically handmade. And that could have included both sewing with a needle as well as a sewing machine. Um, these things are no longer on view for the public at the present time, but that doesn't mean some point in the future we'll be able to do uh, another um, exhibit. And if you are interested, you can make an appointment to see the things in person. You can send us an email and we can set up a, a visit like that. There are various companies. Here's a question about um, reenactors. Um, suggestions for pattern companies. There are quite a few. And um, if you look up reenactors on the internet, I think you could land on, on a number of them. Um, there are some folks who have done, um, uh, have used our clothing to create some patterns, like past, uh, pres uh, I'm, I'm gonna say the wrong thing at this time of the evening, but suffice it to say that if you call actually our educator, Director of Education, Jen Green, she does a lot of, she wears uh, reproduction historical clothing and she may have suggestions for you. And yes, there's no doubt that there are Facebook groups. Um, there were morning dresses, but they were more typical in the late 1800s than, uh, than, what, than what we see anyway in the early 1800s. And that's because there was a lot more consumerism. There was a clothing, became, clothing was still, still significant in terms of reflecting personal taste, economic status, and, and belief systems by the late 1800s, but it had become a commercial good. It, it, it got to the point where in wills and probated inventories, it was barely even mentioned anymore. Um, it was much more affordable and much more 
um, readily available. People had a lot more clothing in the late 1800s than they did in the early 1800s. We did not clean the garments in order to install them. We, um, in our world, in the museum, we try to say less is more because sometimes cleaning can um, actually damage the clothing. But I will say this, that with certain kinds of fabrics, it was perfectly acceptable and very helpful to steam them. And um, there were a couple of dresses where steaming was very advantageous, but you don't want to do that with watered silk because you'll get rid of the pattern. Um, that's a part of the um, technology of creating that pattern. This collection has been accumulated since 1893. So thank goodness for the community that who over the many decades have been generous in supporting this institution. Uh, let's see. We did not show any from the inside, but that's a whole other um, exhibit. It would be great to turn some of these, some of them are really sturdy and we could turn them inside out. We also have another dress that we've never intended really to exhibit. It's not in terrific condition, but we thought it's a Quaker changeable silk dress. And we thought that would be a great thing to show the pieces patterns of a dress. So someday that would be really great to show things inside out. And other than that, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions they would like to add. All righty. Oh, it looks like everyone's perfect. Yep, we've asked all the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Ellen. And thank you to everyone who joined us for tonight's speaker series. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful night and a wonderful holiday season. Awesome.